Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of December 2nd, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, what we expect to see in the coming fall revenue forecast and the governor's FY21 budget proposal. Second, ANWR isn't only an Alaska issue, it's become a global one as well. And third, in a letter to the editor, Roger Marks does an excellent job rebutting the latest arguments from the oil tax initiative. And now, let's join Michael. And we're also going to kick things off here with a discussion about the revenue forecast and the budget, which, of course, are going to fall here within this next two-week time frame. Let's, uh, let's get started. Well, uh, this is the, the time of year when, when we start getting numbers and we start getting ready for the, uh, for the upcoming session and, uh, and, and dealing with sort of the baseline for what the state will have and, and what the state's facing as it, as it enters the session. Uh, the, the revenue forecast uh, is expected to come out late this week, uh, Friday probably. Uh, and the budget comes out within the next two weeks. It's due on the 15th, which is a Sunday, which probably will mean it comes out on the on on the Monday uh, would be my guess. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna face some challenges uh, as these numbers start coming out. The revenue forecast. Um, I don't expect uh, uh, people to be jumping up and down for joy uh, for what they're gonna see in the revenue forecast. We've been underrunning uh, uh, the forecast uh, so far this year we're five months in uh, both production uh, oil production and um, uh, oil prices have been lower uh, than the state's uh, than the state forecast in the in the spring revenue forecast um, and I think that's going to it, it production is really to a point where it's unlikely it's going to catch up with uh, with the projection by the end of the fiscal year price is bouncing around and price may uh, may uh, uh, strengthen to the point where it uh, uh, gets back to the forecast uh, but with production down that means uh, uh, oil revenues overall oil revenues will be down um, and i think we're going to see that not only for uh, this year for the rest of the for the the final projection for uh, fiscal year uh, 29 or 2020 um, but I think we're going to see that sort of carryover um, uh, reduction in, in projected uh, revenues uh, going forward out, out the rest of year out of the rest of the the, the ten year forecast, um, and that's going to make make things tough. I mean, we're 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 going to face a situation where uh, revenues are not going to be where we uh, even where we want it, even where we projected them to be in spring, um, even for the current fiscal year, and that's going to that's going to you know increase the the pressure on uh, the, the budget for the remaining for the remainder of this fiscal year, as well as next fiscal year, as well as uh, where we're headed headed beyond that. Um, at the same time, uh, I think we're going to see we won't see this in the revenue forecast, but we'll see this in the budget. I think we're going to see that that uh, costs uh, for this fiscal year are going to be higher than projected, uh, in part because of what's gone on with uh, with Medicaid. Um, and I think there were projections of, of cost savings in Medicaid that I don't think are 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 coming to fruition. Um, and I think we're going to see pressure on on the cost side as well. So that's going to that's going to mean uh, two things for the upcoming session. 
Uh, one is uh, right off the bat, there's going to be pressure on on what to do about the remainder of fiscal year uh, 2019 with revenues down um, and with costs likely up. Uh, uh, there's going to be a, 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 a bigger gap, uh, a bigger deficit than than uh, forecast at uh, uh, in the spring revenue forecast, the time of the, the budget was was finally approved. Um, and that's going to mean the legislature is going to have to uh, fill that gap in some fashion uh, on a on a short term basis just to get through the remainder of fiscal year 20. Um, and then for fiscal year 21, we're going to see, I, I think we're going to see um, some lowering in revenues. Uh, we're going to see upward cost pressure as there always is uh, on budgets. Uh, that's going to lead to a, a significant gap. And I think we're going to see the legislature struggle, legislature and governor struggle uh, in dealing with that. Um, and and that's going to show up, as I say, in part in the revenue forecast that comes out later this week, and it's going to show up in part uh, in the budget that shows up uh, shows up in a couple of weeks. Well, this leads me to a couple different questions, Brad. I mean, first and foremost, uh, you know, the 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 governor's budget is really going to be the sticking point. We've seen so much pressure, so much backlash coming back. Uh, any predictions on your part as to where you know what you think we're going to see in this? Are we going to see a budget that's going to attempt to be flat? Are we going to, uh, you know, he said on the program here a uh, week before last that he was going to probably still be attempting to look for some cuts, but I don't know how significant those cuts will be based on the reaction and, of course, the reality of what happened after his budget, his his revised budget dropped last year. Any predictions from you? Well, he's closed off. He's closed off a lot of options. Um, uh before the Dunleavy administration started, you and I would talk a lot about the university, um, and he made significant cuts in the first in his first budget proposal in the university. But the ultimate agreement he reached with the university uh, uh, for a fairly limited amount of cuts uh, compared to what he had initially proposed, uh, and extending that over three years sort of forecloses the option of of going after the university. He's he's separately said. Uh, that uh, in another in another uh, forum that uh, he's not going to go after K through 12 um, and not make significant cuts uh, propose significant cuts in K through 12 and then last week you and I discussed that the the remarks he made at um, uh, at uh, the municipal league AML that uh, uh, he's not going to go after uh, uh, upstreaming taxes. Uh, uh, local taxes in the way that he had in the initial budget proposal last year, which is about four hundred million dollars. So he, he's closing off options that 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 would give him the ability, uh, might give him the ability to come in with a with a balanced budget without uh, without looking at uh, at a significant fiscal gap. Um, I, he's he's put himself in a position, I think, where he where we are going to have a gap, um, and that's going to be closed. That's got to be closed somehow. Uh, it's either going to be closed through, uh, ultimately, it's either going to be closed through PFD cuts, PFD taxes, uh, or it's going to be closed through drawing down the ERA, because uh, we don't have the CBR and the SBR anymore, uh, drawing down the ERA, which is essentially a tax on future Alaskans, uh, or it's going to be uh, closed in, in some other form of taxes uh, on the current generation. And and that's going to be, I mean, that's going to be a tough issue for the for the legislature and for the governor to deal with. There's just not a, I guess the, I guess boiling it down, Michael. There's just not a, enough room left in the areas that he hasn't closed off um, uh, to to get to a, a cuts only budget. Um, and and so we're going to be dealing with a, a, a significant gap between traditional revenues, um, adding in the 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 amount of the uh, uh, draw from the permanent fund that doesn't that isn't dedicated or designated for the permanent fund dividend um, and we're going to be dealing with a significant gap between those revenue that revenue level uh, and the spending level and that's going to have to be closed uh, somehow so it's uh we're, we're facing we're, we're facing the same discussion uh, this coming year that we've had the past several years which is how do you close the budget gap? And as I say, there's going to be there's three choices. It's it's ERA, which is a tax on future Alaskans, PFD cuts, which which is a tax on middle and lower income Alaska families, or some other form of, uh, uh, in my view, more equitable taxation.
Don't want to go too far afield, but another question had come up when you initially started talking about revenue shortfalls, especially in 2019. And I want to talk just briefly about the the dirty little secret in the legislature, which is the supplemental budget, um, which uh, which always hits. You know, usually after the close of of a, of a previous fiscal, or you get close to uh, to closing it, and the supplemental budget is what happens after you've got everything approved, everything's done, and then this is kind of the true up at the end of the year. And the problem is is that the supplemental is almost never really never really talked about or framed in the position of what was the budget for fiscal year X. They always talk about what the approved budget was at the end of the year. They never tell you about all the supplemental spending that has to go on to actually true that up, and it's always more. Right. I mean, sometimes to the terms of hundreds of millions of dollars more. And and this kind of, you know, raises its ugly head here in this discussion. If we start looking at a revenue shortfall based on where we were at previously. Yeah. And we're going to have I mean, there is going to be a supplemental budget. I, there's been a lot of discussion about Medicaid, about that Medicaid, that, that Medicaid wasn't fully funded uh, uh, in this year's budget uh, and that uh, we've had. Uh, some cost savings that were anticipated in Medicaid haven't come through, haven't been realized, uh, and that we're going to have uh, additional Medicaid costs that over, over and above what was contemplated at the end of the budget cycle. So there, there, there may be some of that in, in other areas uh, as well, but certainly Medicaid is going to be one, and, and it's likely not going to be – it's likely going to be a, a not insignificant number. Uh, I don't want to put a – Peg a, peg a projection to it, but it's not going to be trivial. Um, and between that, with costs rising um, uh, that are going to have to be addressed through the supplemental, and uh, uh, revenues dropping uh, as a result of, of production and prices not not achieving forecast, uh, there's going to be a gap in there that's going to have to be addressed. Um, it's uh, <laughs> how they're going to I mean the, the near term gap usually gets addressed through the CBR but the problem is the CBR is down to two two billion dollars um, and yes you can you can use it you, you know there, there's two billion dollars there but that's the level that most people have said we sort of need to hold in in ready reserve in the event we have some sort of of, of significant uh, uh, event like taps going out for for several months due to a due to an earthquake or something that that two billion dollars is sort of the level that that most people talk about as as being our necessary emergency reserve so right um it, it's going to be i mean the supplemental is going to be tough the, 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 there is going to be a supplemental and it is going to be tough brad keithley is our guest alaskans for sustainable budgets uh this moves us on from our first discussion of revenues and uh, revenue forecasts and the budget on to the second discussion, which is, uh, you know, the governor, well, I guess that's part of the first discussion. Is the governor making the right decisions? There was a piece by Kevin Meyer that kind of talked about this and said, this essentially is the conversation that we've needed to have and nobody's been willing to have. And and Dunleavy had the, had the, the, the courage to talk about it, I guess. Yeah. I, that piece by Kevin Meyer was funny. I mean, it's Kevin Meyer was one of the leading proponents of, you know, build a, a AstroTurf football field at every high school you can find, uh, uh, do groundbreakings at every every week you can at UAA. Um, uh, Kevin Meyer was one of the leading uh, uh, shovel the money out uh, while we had it advocates, uh, uh, both in the House when he was co-chair of finance in the House and in the Senate when he was co-chair of finance in the Senate and, uh, and when he was president of the Senate. Uh, he's uh, he's sort of the poster boy for the problem uh, that we had, and and to see Kevin saying, "Oh well, we had to, we finally had to have these discussions, and it's great discussions to have." It was just it was just humorous. I mean, for those who for those who understand the history and the background and, and Kevin's role uh, in all of that, he and Bill Stoltz were sort of the two big uh, spend 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 it while you can uh, proponents, and and to read through that was just it, it was just a sort of a funny thing but, yeah. but i mean he did say he 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 did say you know we, we're, we're having these come to jesus moments we need to have these come to jesus moments yes we do yes it's great we're having them 
uh, but Kevin, you were the one that <laughs> you were one of the great contributors to have to to cause us that to now have these come to Jesus. Christ. Yeah, the irony uh, in that in that article was so thick you could have cut it with a knife. But uh, you know, I guess maybe maybe it's time where everybody has a, again that eye opening experience. Maybe he is he's done that. There's no. Uh, no better convert than a, or no better zealot than a previous convert, or whatever the whatever the 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 uh, the old axiom is on that, uh, Brad. When I was reading that, I mean, it just sounds like this guy has been a long term believer all of a sudden uh, in everything that's going on. And again, the the irony was not lost on me that this is a guy who never saw a dollar that he didn't love to spend in these uh, in this regard. Um, you know, on top of this. And that's a that's a problem. He said this is begin. The governor governor presents a budget in which expenditures met anticipated revenue. This began a necessary dialogue with Alaskans, a dialogue we have avoided for decades. Well, a lot of us have been trying to talk about this. And he was one of the most loud, you know, the loudest voices that was ignoring the whole the whole thing. Oh, and Kevin, Kevin has historically been one of the, the first to sort of move to, to cut the PFD to, to balance the budget by by PFD cuts. I remember a conversation with him, oh gosh, 2016 maybe, when Walker had first announced it. Um, and Kevin was was quiet about it, but Kevin Kevin supported that move using the PFD. I mean, as a as a representative of the top of a top 20% district, you can sort of see that coming. But uh, Kevin uh, uh, supported that move. And, and he's, I mean, Kevin's just, Kevin has not been uh, on the on the on the Dunleavy side of the of of policy at all in uh, in his career up until his election as lieutenant governor, I, I sort of I, I had this internal chuckle going on when I when I saw him referring to the administration as the Dunleavy Meyer administration. I just I I I I had never really put that in my head before. Um, and it's just, I mean, it's like two complete opposites uh, in terms of how they've approached fiscal matters over time. Uh, it's great to see Kevin being supportive of the administration, but but he's a big part of the of the reason that we're in this in this situation in the first place. He was one of the big proponents of, of spending all the way through. Well, I mean, I think that again, I I don't know what's going to happen, and I don't know if you want to comment uh, quickly here during the break. On the, uh, the the naming of the new revenue commissioner, Mike Barnhill, uh, or not, uh, we still don't have. We got he is the interim. We've got an interim who was the deputy over at OMB after Don Arduin was uh, escorted out of the building. And so I don't know if you you have any thoughts on these folks or if you you've heard anything for the record. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, for, I th- go ahead. I, oh, I think Barnhill's a great appointment. I. I uh, Mike and I have had our differences. Um, uh, he wanted to issue bonds to, to fund Persenter's debt. Uh, he was a proponent of the oil and gas uh, uh, credit bonds that are still hung up in the Supreme Court. Uh, but in terms of cost cutting, Mike was the was was at the tip of the spear last year on 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 the university cuts on making the cuts to the university. He was the one that went up to to Fairbanks and 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 sort of took the wrath for. Uh, the administration proposing the cuts. He was the one that was sort of in the middle of trying to explain where the where the cuts for, came from, and he stuck to his ground as uh, as as the pushback came uh, from the university. So I I'm I'm a I'm a big fan of Mike's, um, and I think it's a great appointment, um, and I think Mike has been uh, realistic about uh, about the budget gap and has been realistic about what it's going to take to close the budget gap. Um, and I and I think it's great to have him in the revenue commissioner spot, especially uh, as we go into this session, because I think he's aligned with with the governor's thinking on on protecting and preserving the PFD. Um, and that means we're going to have to talk about other revenue sources. And I think Mike's the perfect person to uh, to, to be in a position to talk about those revenue sources. So well, I, I think it's a great appointment. Well, let's talk about contrast and compare between Tangerman and Barnhill then. I mean, Tangerman specifically said that he was leaving kind of over a philosophical difference in budgeting, uh, you know, with the governor. I mean, that was kind of intimated in his in his uh, letter, uh, his exit letter um, that, you know, that there was maybe some talk about taxation. Is it, Do you see that coming out of Barnhill based on your experience so far? I got about a minute, uh, minute 20 here. We are going to be talking about taxation, PFD cuts or taxes. We are going to be ca- talking about taxation. What what Bruce wasn't willing to do was to talk about other more equitable forms of, of, of revenue. 
And I think we're going to find, I think we're going to see Mike uh, more open to that uh, and more open to defending having a discussion about other more equitable forms of revenue uh, than using, uh, than using PFD cuts. And I think that's, I think that's the, that's all the difference in the world between Bruce and Mike. Well, hopefully, uh, we'll uh, you know, hopefully it, it it works well. Plus, we've got, of course, now the legislature is now back at sixty. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to review Gillis uh, or uh, or or talk with Revac or anybody else. In the meanwhile, I got about thirty seconds here. You want to comment on any changes you see coming up? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that much about Gillis, um, and so uh, what, what I'm getting is secondhand. I don't know him personally, and so what I'm getting is secondhand. It seems like he's just going to sort of fill the Revac spot, the, the the lane that Revac had created for himself in the House, at least. Um, and so I don't see any great changes uh, coming out of that. At second on the list is Anwar, and uh, it's gonna it's a big part of Alaska's future. And uh, there are some concerns about uh, Anwar and oil development moving forward. Yeah, so th- this is a little bit of a jump shift from where we were in segment one, certainly. Uh, this goes back to the oil side. Uh, we have talked a lot uh, in Alaska about the potential of ANWR and indeed about the potential of, of Arctic uh, oil development uh, in general, but ANWR is sort of the, the holy grail, uh, has been the holy grail of that, something that, that, that Alaskans for decades have pursued uh, getting open. Um, and now, uh, thanks to uh, Lisa Murkowski's agreement to vote for the tax cuts uh, and being able to work in ANWR as part of that bill, um, uh, we have we have Anwar in in process of being open for leasing, but but that's that sort of opened up a, a whole new can of worms that that Alaskans need to be aware of. Um, I know I've, I've received pushback from a lot uh, about even talking about this issue, but Alaskans need to be aware of it, and that is the the, the broader concerns about climate change uh, and the broader concerns about uh, about. Uh, opposition to uh, uh, development, uh, Anwar development, and the opposition to, frankly, development in uh, in in the Arctic uh, in general. Uh, I think we're going to see this show up as uh, as the administration pushes forward on on trying to redefine the the development plans for MPRA, uh, and the area is open for uh, development in MPRA uh, as well. And it's not just it's not just opposition. Uh, from from various environmental groups that that's the concern it's it's the effect that has on the financing uh, of of these projects um, and that's really what this article that that I, I sent you that's in the uh, uh, national public radio it's a national article that's really what this article uh, is important to me for it talks about the the concerns that banks and financial institutions have, about financing uh, specifically ANWR, but but financing uh, Arctic oil projects um, in general. You can't do uh, producers can't do uh, Arctic oil projects if they if they have either opposition from shareholders or they don't have the financing uh, to be able to to do these projects. And one quote in particular from this article is is particularly concerning. It said Goldman it, and focuses on Goldman Sachs, which is one of the premier um, uh, institutional bankers, uh, one of the premier bankers, um, uh, investment bankers in New York. Goldman Sachs, or globally, uh, Goldman Sachs, for example, outlines its human rights and environmental concerns in an overall policy framework, but doesn't directly mention the Arctic or the refuge specifically. Nonetheless, a Goldman Sachs spokesperson person confirmed that the bank has not, quote, has not and would not expect to finance oil exploration in the Arctic National Wildlife Ref- Refuge, ANWR. Goldman Sachs has not and would not expect to finance oil exploration. Well, there are others There are others out there in the world who, who others in, in addition to Goldman Sachs, who finance these things. Um, and so it, Goldman Sachs saying that uh, in and of itself, is not a, is not a huge concern, but Goldman Sachs is fairly representative. They're sort of the gold standard of what invest of how investment banks uh, banks think, um, and and it's sort of representative of what we're beginning to see uh, among other investment banks, among other uh, banks generally in the world, um, and among uh, institutional investors uh, generally in the world. So 
yes, we're making progress in terms of, and, and, and the reason the reason they have these concerns is not so much because they are uh, uh, strong believers in climate change or don't believe in climate change, but it's because they see the risk uh, involved uh, in these projects, the risk that that the opposition from the uh, environment environmental groups and others are is either going to slow these projects down to the point that uh, you won't get a good return out of out of any investment you make in the projects, or completely stop these projects. In which event, uh, why should anybody you know why should the investment bank should be investing in the in these projects in the first place? It's the risk aspect uh, created by uh, the opposition these projects are going to have uh, that that creates the concern on the banker side. Um, and in turn, uh, it creates an issue, I think, for for the the ability to go forward with these projects. So as we're making I, what what Alaskans really need to understand is as we're making progress on the regulatory front on it, on at least getting these pro these uh, uh, these prospects these these regions open for leasing. As we're making progress on that, we're losing. Uh, progress on on the ability to finance these projects uh, out of concern uh, that's being raised about uh, about the, the the risk that these projects are going to undertake. And this is a really kind of a PR battle, right? I mean, you've got Dementev, uh, Bernadette Dementev, who's been a face of this for quite a while now. Uh, she's made it all the way onto the front page here of NPR with this, and and it it really comes down to kind of a hearts and minds campaign of of perspective and image for a lot of these places. They don't want to be associated with it again. And that, that affects their bottom line in, in terms of return on investment and many other things. And to them, it's just like, you know, nobody wants to handle radioactive plutonium. So why would we do that? Yeah, exactly. It, it, that's a, that's a good analogy. I mean, it's Wells Fargo took a big hit out of, out of the financing that, or out of its agreement to finance the Dakota access pipeline, the pipeline that led to, to protests uh, in the Dakota's, um, uh, a couple of years ago, um, and took a big, big, big hit out of that, and that project was delayed, and the and the the economics of that project turned into sort of turned into mush uh, along the way as a result of the delays and the increased costs uh, out of the uh, out of the opposition to it. So it's uh, with with all of the other opportunities to in, in the oil industry um, and in the energy industry, the energy sector generally to invest. Um, uh, the question is, I mean, these banks are facing the question of why do I want to be an investor in a project that's going to create, a, is, is going to have such a high, pro, high profile, is going to have a lot of uh, a lot of energy spent trying to oppose it, a lot of risk, regulatory risk in being able to complete the project or being able to do it, do it timely. Why do I want to invest there? Um, and I'm and, and I, the bank, I'm going to get a lot of static out of it. Uh, as well, why do I want to invest there uh, as opposed to someplace else? And it's and 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 so that means that it, it is sort of a, 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 a PR battle, but it's also a a, a, a dollars and cents battle. I mean, we've right. got to to be successful in these projects. We've got to prove that these projects are going to be able to be completed on time uh, with uh, with relatively low costs and produce the high returns that we want. If we're not able to demonstrate that. Uh, these banks are going to put their money uh, are going is going to are going to put their money elsewhere, and that's that's as much a risk to being able to complete Anwar and to be able to complete other Arctic oil projects um, as as anything that uh, anything else that's out there. The long and the short of it is, don't look to Anwar to be the saving grace of Alaska right now. Number th number three is uh, the uh, 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 is the oil taxation. We got about uh, three minutes here. Yeah, so there's been uh, some some columns written in ADN. We're we certainly can expect uh, to see uh, uh, to see more columns coming up, or more articles coming up, and more written about it. Joe Pascavan, a former senator from the Fairbanks area, area wrote an article in uh, in the ADN and in other uh, that made other newspapers as well in the state uh, supporting the uh, supporting the oil oil tax initiative uh, and 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 making statements about uh, oil taxes that uh, that that he argued supported uh, the initiative, some of which was that 
uh, oil taxes uh, uh, didn't, uh, that the oil industry wasn't paying for themselves, that we were net negative on taxes uh, after you took into account uh, amounts paid uh, to the oil industry and, and various article and various uh, arguments like that. Roger Marks, uh, who is, uh, was uh, the state's oil economist for a long time, uh, involved uh, in several of the battles over the decades uh, regarding oil taxes, uh, took that on in a letter uh, to the editor of the ADN that I think is important for people who are thinking about oil taxes and, 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 and Alaskans are going to be thinking about oil taxes in the coming months uh, in a letter that I think is very important for, uh, for people to read. It's a, it's a letter to the editor in the ADN dated uh, November 25th. And those, I mean, it's a pretty short letter. It breaks it down into three. He goes after Pascavan in three separate points, uh, which we'll, I guess we'll have to get to over the top of the hour. But it's worth a read for people to go actually take a look at. Yeah, th- we, we've got to be, we got to be fa- facts based as we, as we deal with oil taxes. Pascavan's making populist arguments, but you've really got to, you've got to understand the basic facts as we go as we go through this oil tax debate and and roger's letter is a great place to do that and when i read this i thought boy this is like one of the most succinct letters i've ever seen as far as taking on some of the issues um you know he he breaks it down into three separate uh three separate uh, ticking uh you know tick points here and basically you know calls pascavan out on these three separate issues to begin with yeah so so joe stated pascavan stated that production taxes are negative. That is that the that the state is paying more in production taxes back to the industry uh, than they're getting out of the industry. And that, and Roger does a great job demonstrating why that's not true. We're getting the state's getting about five hundred million dollars a year projected to stay at about that rate uh, for the next uh, over the next ten years. Uh, we're getting about five hundred million dollars a year in uh, uh, in production taxes. Uh, Joe argues that that what are called the old the the per barrel credits are 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 credits that are being paid back to the industry and roger does a great job in rebutting that joe argues that you have to take into account uh the oil and gas tax uh credit program that was ended a couple of years ago uh and and payments due under that in uh in calculating what the industry is uh paying and Roger does a great job explaining why that's not the case. So it's there's there's just we're going to have a lot of these arguments, and you and I are probably going to talk about them a lot as we get into the new year. But but you're going to see a lot of these arguments that by the by the initiative proponents this sort of mush together a bunch of things, uh, and and they try to turn it into an allegation that the industry isn't isn't paying. Uh, 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 production taxes and the industry is getting more in credits than they're getting in production taxes. None of that's true once you once you parse through it, but but they try to mush it together to make that claim. Um, and, and Alaskans need to understand what they're doing. Alaskans need to read things like Roger's good letter um, uh, that that really sort of breaks it apart and 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 explains why why these why these arguments that the initiative proponents are making just don't hold up. In addition to that, in addition to the arguments that, that Roger's making, at the end of the day, there's the question about uh, what what happens to our production curve, what happens to investment, what happens to development if we triple the taxes, uh, which is what the initiative production taxes, which which is what the initiative uh, proposes, and the initiative doesn't the, the the proponents of the initiative don't have any answer to that. They don't know what happens. They think money goes up. Uh, but but they really have no response when you ask. Well, doesn't that have an impact on investment and on development and on the and on the production curve? Isn't that really just a tax uh, on future Alaskans? The initiative really has no response to that. They just sort of mush over it. So so it, there, there's going to be a, a series of these claims by the by the initiative, and then and then a series of responses. And 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 Alaskans who are really interested in this need to evaluate both the claims and the responses. Uh, as they consider whether to be supportive uh, of the initiative. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, uh, is our guest. Uh, I mean, I think that's the biggest thing, Brad, that, that, that came out of this whole point is saying you can't throw all these things together, throw them up in a blender and say, look, see how bad and wrong. And I mean, first of all, talking about the past credits, 
which will still be owed. I mean, they're they're not even they you know you can't even look at them at this point as credits. These are just liabilities. This was all approved by the legislature, all approved by our elected officials. We've all agreed that we owe it. The question is, how do we pay for it? It's not. It doesn't go away if the tax passes, if the initiative passes. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, we got about seven hundred fifty million dollars in past credits that under under a under a program that we've terminated. Uh, there's no longer any additional credits being accrued, but we've got this book of seven hundred fifty million dollars of credits that that needs to be accounted for and paid in some way. Um, and and the legislature has not been particularly good about doing that, uh, but but we need to address uh, that seven hundred and fifty million dollars in credits. But it, but it doesn't. I mean, that's not going. The initiative is not going to change that one way or the other. Um, and it's just every every time the initiative makes an argument, you're going to need Alaskans need to look for the counter argument and then decide for themselves which they believe is 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 more valid. But it, but it's not the, the initiative is just mushing a bunch of things together. Um, uh, in trying to in trying to make their case that that don't hold up when you look at those when you look at the pieces uh, uh, individually. Brett asks a question. I think we have time for it here. What is the ratio between royalty and tax payments received by the state and credits given to oil and gas companies? The ratio. So royalties. I I would need to look that up. Um, probably royalties are higher than. Uh, uh, production taxes. Production taxes are about 500 million a year right now. Royalties, I want to say, are higher than that, um, and so royalties are are at a at a higher ratio than production taxes. Credits, um, we've got a we've got a misnomer. Um, uh, the 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 credit system that some people talk about, uh, that's in the that's in the current oil and gas tax uh, uh, production tax scheme. Isn't isn't a credit in the sense that dollars are being given to the industry? What we what we're calling a credit is really a a, a step adjust adjustment mechanism that increases the tax rate as oil prices go up or reduces the tax rate as oil prices go down. And that adjustment mechanism is called credits in the statute. It's not credits in the sense that dollars are being given to the industry. It's more of it's a, mere it's merely a, a change in the tax rate. It's a progressivity. It's it's essentially it's called a credit, but it's really more of the progressivity of the tax rate as oil prices go up and down. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's just an adjustment mechanism. But again, not to be confused with the previous oil tax credits where they were in fact actually giving money back to the oil companies. Uh, in terms of actual payouts, and so again, there's there's a lot of parts and confusion here, and can and, and it can be manipulated in that way. So we definitely need to look at that. We're out of time, though, Brad. Thank you so much for coming on board, Michael. As always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.